So, uh, once again, uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm honored that uh, to be uh, to be speaking uh, in Rom's conference. Uh, as Francesco said, uh, I think many of us uh, will have our own stories to tell, and I hope we will hear those stories at the at the banquet. But uh, in a nutshell, I would say that I I'm, I'm feel very privileged that I've had the uh, opportunity to work so closely with a person who's all not only brilliant but also very general. And uh, I would say he's both my teacher and mentor um, and collaborator. So I, as I've said, I've learned a lot of things from him over the years, and I thought I'd pick a theme that was that is. Um, uh, it distributed throughout his work over the last uh, 40 or plus years, as, um, 50 years as a mathematician. Uh, and this is the primitive root conjecture of, of Arden. Uh, I'll say some old things and maybe some new things, and, uh, uh, but the main thing is it's a short talk, so I will keep it high level. Arden's. And it is, I should say, in addition to the, all the other uh, honor, honor and pleasurable uh, emotions one may feel at this time, it's also uh, uh, a pleasure to be holding a piece of chalk and writing on the board. <laughs> so the conjecture is this, that if I take a, an integer a, which is not plus or minus one or a square, then a is a primitive root, because a is an integer, is a primitive root first for infinitely many primes p. Primitive root mod p. Uh, so this kind of idea was already known to Gauss. By the way, just to be clear, uh, primitive root means that I'm looking at uh, the cyclic group. This is a cyclic group of non-zero residue classes mod p, and a mod p generates it. That's the meaning of the word primitive root. And I, I believe Gauss already knew or suspected that this is the case, but didn't formulate an explicit uh, statement of, of, uh, of the conjecture or even how frequently A should be primitive root mod P. This was done later by Arden, who if we set N sub A of X to be the number of primes of the X, it said A is a primitive root mod p, his conjecture is that this is asymptotic to a constant mildly depending on a times the total number of primes. In other words, there's a positive density of primes for which a is a primitive root mod p. And as stated here, this is an, this problem is open. It is still a conjecture. But, but in the, um, many works of Ram, there's lots of insights have been gained about this particular conjecture, variations of this conjecture, applications of this conjecture, and so on. And one could, I was looking over some of those papers, and I'd say that one can write a volume just, just on those contributions. Now, one theorem that is known is uh, due to Hooley, who, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, the, the generalized Riemann hypothesis, uh, proved the following, that n sub a of x is the density it's supposed to be with an explicit error term of x log log x over log x squared. So this shows that assuming the Riemann, generalized Riemann hypothesis, Artin's conjecture is true. Now when you look at this, it's a little bit surprising. And the reason it's surprising is that we're used to thinking of the assumption of the Riemann hypothesis as resulting in a power saving in the error term. Now you, you have some sort of distribution, let's say for primes, using the Riemann hypothesis, you get an error term of x to the half instead of x over log x squared. So it's surprising that there is no power saving. In the error. 
And the, the point here is that um, the reason, the reason this happens is that we need not one Riemann hypothesis, but we need infinitely many. So just to make clear what that means, and also to be clear about what the connection possibly could be between the Riemann hypothesis and the statement about Artin's conjecture, uh, the connection is the following. So one con considers the fields, consider the Kummer extensions. Let's say L sub k, where k is an integer, which is q adjoint uh, the kth root of 1 and the kth root of a. And uh, let's say, for example, so let's, and, and what one needs is the uh, consider the, zeta, the Dedekind zeta function of these fields. And what one needs is the Riemann hypothesis for, for all of these. And maybe you can refine this a little bit. You need it for the prime when k is prime. But you need it for infinitely many L functions or zeta functions. And the connection still between um, this and being this, these fields and these zeta functions and being a primitive root is that if I look at least for the case q is prime, so I have LQ and inside here I have the cyclotomic field and I have Q and I have a rational prime here which is let's say um, uh, prime to A and to Q, not different from Q and prime to A, then um, what does it mean for this prime to split completely here? Well firstly, if it splits completely here, then it splits completely here, so P is 1 mod Q. And then one has an extra reciprocity law that says to go to split from, from to split all the way up to here means that the congruence a to the p minus one over q one mod one p has to hold. So to, for a prime p to split completely here means that first it should split it completely here, so p is one mod q, and a to the p minus one over q should be congruent to one mod p. So in particular, this condition here tells us that the order of a mod p divides p minus 1 over q. So in particular, if it splits completely, it's not going to be a primitive root. And in fact, that's the only condition. So that p splits, uh, p is a primitive root, uh, sorry, a is a primitive root. mod p, if and only if, apart from ramification conditions, um, p does not split completely. In any L of q. It's enough actually to take the prime ones because the, in general, the, uh, the kth one will be a compositum of the, of the L's of q's. Okay, so now, this is good because we have this mysterious, highly nonlinear um, condition on A or on P translated into a, a kind of splitting condition in number fields. And therefore, it, it's susceptible to methods using the Chebotarov density theorem. So if we set a pi x LK, be the number of primes of the x such that p splits completely in L sub k, then the number we're looking for can be obtained by sieving these, these numbers out. The number we're looking for, n sub a of x, can be written as a sum mu of k pi of x L sub k. 
And the Chabotarov density theorem gives you the asymptotics at least of this. So this is going to be roughly 1 over the degree. I'll write this as n of k. So n of k is the degree. times pi of x. Now if I assume the Riemann hypothesis for, for the dedekind zeta function of L sub k, then this is O of uh, x to the half log um, k a x. I think that's, yeah. This looks like a perfectly fine uh, asymptotic distribution. You assume the Riemann hypothesis, you get a power saving. But the problem, of course, is you have to put this now into here. And this is an infinite sum. Actually, it's a finite sum. You can truncate at k less than x. But essentially, it's an infinite sum. So the main term is fine. It gives you mu of k over n of k times pi of x. Plus then, but then you have to put absolute value signs on the error term. And you have a sum over k um, x to the half log k a. And this k, the best you can say is it goes up to x. So the error term will dominate the main term, and you get nothing. Because okay, so that's why when uh, at first, uh, this was why it took until the 60s, really, to do this, because the obvious approach it doesn't work. So what Hooley did was he supplement. You have to supplement. Hooley's method is to supplement GRH, if you, if you think, imagine GRH is such a powerful hypothesis, and you're talking about supplementing the GRH, you have to supplement it with a sieve method plus an elementary argument. So these, uh, the sieve method is through the Brunt-Hitchmarsh theorem, and the elementary argument is just through counting prime divisors of a certain number. So these things are able to accomplish what the Riemann hypothesis is not able to do. Very important to keep this in mind because this theme keeps recurring. So the problem in, in if you look at this, the problem is that the error term, when you just apply it to this, doesn't really see k enough. It only sees it as a logarithmic contribution here. In particular, as k goes to infinity, the error term doesn't go to zero. So this raises the question then. So Holy did it through these methods, but, but as we saw, you just squeak through. You don't get the power saying. So this raises the question. Of what additional information about zeros, about zeros of L functions will give a power saving. So a long time ago, Ram and I worked on this, thought about this, and we didn't publish at that. But then later on, we published a paper with Peng Ji. Wong, I don't know if he's in the audience. There's this. Well, I've never met him before, so I, um, So what we showed is, so this is with Ram, myself, and Pengji. What we did is we formulated a, a pair correlation hypothesis. For art and L function. try to capture something about what's happening, a subtler property of this. By the way, I didn't, uh, I'm, somebody keep track of the time. You, you have to keep track of the time, because I won't. <laughs> um, now, when you think about pair correlation and prime number theory, the general view is that um, it doesn't improve the error terms very much. If you apply, for example, pair correlation for the Riemann zeta function, and ask what does it mean for the error term in the prime number theorem, it's not a significant improvement. But in the non-abelian case, it has a dramatic effect. So this, unlike the, unlike uh, the, actually, it's, all, it's true all over the abelian case, 
um, this is non abelian case this has this has a dramatic effect on the error and I try to explain what what effect it does have. Um, so the first is, first point is that the so now let me let me take the case of a of a Galois extension of fields. In our application, for example, k will be q and f will be one of those alpha k's. But I just have a Galois um, extension. Then the first thing is that the Dedekind zeta function of f is not a primitive object in general; it factors. And in analytic number theory, you know that when you have a good factorization of an L function. It's better to work with the factors. You'll get sharper results. So in this case, it, it factors as a product of art and L functions for this extension. And these L functions are indexed by irreducible characters of the Galois group, and they occur with multiplicity equal to the degree of the character. So if, if this is a non-abelian group, in general, these multiplicities will be bigger than one. So one really ought to work with, with these factors now, uh, the problem, of course, is one doesn't know the holomorphy of these, so one has to assume another conjecture of Artin. Namely, that Ls chi f over k has a continuation as an analytic function, function of s, apart possibly Part from a pole at s equals one if chi is the trivial character. Because I'm only going over irreducible characters, it's the only possible way to get the pole. Okay. Um, so now I make an aside here. I just made a general comment that when when um, L functions factor, you should work with the with the uh, factors to get better results. But maybe just this is an important aside. It doesn't really enter into the Artin problem, but but it nevertheless it's an important thing for understanding this this um, uh, point of using the factors. So the factors have to make sense. In other words, you can't just take an Euler product and divide it up a little bit like this into, into two Euler products and then expect now I'll work with these individual pro, uh, subgroupings and expect it to make sense. The factors have to make sense. And a good example of this is if you look at an abelian surface, let's say over Q, there are lots of these with. Um, with a quaternionic multiplication. Um, I think I want this to be indefinite. So in other words, it's, it, it's um, and I want this to be simple, even over Q bar, absolutely simple, a billion surface defined over Q whose endomorphism algebra is an indefinite quaternion division algebra. In other words, when I tensor with R, I get M2R. You have such a thing, then it has several properties. Firstly, it has potential good reduction everywhere. And the second thing is, let's, let's say, let's pretend for a moment it has good reduction everywhere. It can't actually over Q, but let's say it does. Then when I reduce A mod P, the reduction of A to FP is always isogenous to the square of an elliptic curve. To 
do this properly, I should be working over a number field where it acquires a very good reduction, and then this is P will be replaced by primes of that field. At every prime, this uh, absolutely simple abelian surface, reduced mod P, splits. So if you look at the H1L function of this, Therefore, the L function associated to H1 of this uh, abelian, abelian surface will actually be a product, I mean, it's defined locally, it's only defined locally, it will be a square. So at every finite prime, it will be the L function associated to the elliptic curve EP, but the square. And so you might be tempted to say this has some meaning, but it doesn't. See the, the square root has no meaning. And what do I mean by meaning? Square root has no meaning. As far as we know, it does not have analytic continuation or meromorphic continuation, not expected to have a functional equation. Um, and, um, and so you, you can't do anything with it. You can take the square root. So just the principle here that, uh, and by the way, uh, here I can say more, if it does, then A itself splits. In other words, if you could prove properties of the square root, then you can show that the abelian variety was not simple to start with. It itself was a product of two elliptic curves. So the factors, therefore, the L function is a very powerful and useful tool, but it misses some information. It doesn't see something. So you can't see everything through the, through the L function. Okay, that's just an aside, but but I have a, I mean, this kind of pathology doesn't uh, uh, occur as far as I know for R and L functions. In other words, and I think that I'm sure this is provable, although, uh, that if you have an R and L function whose Euler factors look like squares or some powers or, or factor mod P, even for a finite number of primes, I bet you could show that the representation is, re is reducible. Okay, so anyway, uh, in, uh, assume that doesn't happen here, then what we have is uh, we're looking at this, and now the pair correlation hypothesis, pair correlation hypothesis, is for um, individual L functions. One uh, one thing to watch out for in this field is in this area of mathematics is to um, resist the temptation to call uh, number fields L. You run into danger. Somewhere down the road, you'll run into problems. So I use F over K. Okay, so the pair correlation is for this. And um, the, the hypothesis is the following, that one has, firstly, one has the Artin conductor, A chi. So it, it's defined, it's a, it's a conductor of the ground field to the degree times the norm of the conductor ideal, which is defined in terms of ramification of chi's. And when all one needs to know is the property, basically log of a chi is about chi of one times the degree of k to q times some mild ramification terms. I won't write down explicitly. Okay, so then the PC hypothesis is the following. Uh, consider the function P sub T Y chi, which is the sum of this usual weight. Gamma one and gamma two will be running over zeros uh, up to high T of, of what? Of LS chi times um, E of, E of, um, gamma one minus gamma two times x. So this is, well, this should be y. Yeah. So you have a function which sort of weighted way is trying to understand whether there are cancellations in an exponential sum involving gaps between zeros. Hmm? Yes, yes, I'll tell you what w is. It's 
the function 4 over 4 plus u squared u squared and e of alpha is e to the 2 pi i alpha. Okay. So I see I'm rapidly running out of time. Oh, good. This is good. <laughs> it's good to you. <laughs> Thank you for the excuse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the hypothesis then is it's easy to show just by uh, estimates for the number of zeros up to high t, it's easy to show that this function p sub t x chi is bounded by t times log a chi t squared. That's easy. And the pair correlation hypothesis that I'm going to look at, a pair correlation hypothesis, uh, conjecture, anyway, doesn't matter, is that in fact, um, let me not write it with all the decorations, but basically it's this. In other words, you save a, a one log factor. So it looks innocuous enough that you're saving one log factor. And, and I'm, I'm Abusing notation a little bit, there's more to it than this, and there's more variations of this in our paper. But let's just take it as this. And um, using this, you get a new version of the Chebotarov density theorem. Using this, you get a new version. More generally, I can say here now, what would I have up? This extension field f over k with the group G. So let's take a conjugacy class C inside G and ask for the, um, the primes uh, x plus of C x um, f over k. So these are, this is the number of primes prime of k whose Artin symbol is C, so C is some conjugacy. Let's say, it's, let's say for now it's a conjugacy class. It doesn't have to be. It could be a union of conjugacy classes. And the norm of P is less than or equal to X. That's the Chebotarov uh, function. Uh, so we've already seen this in the case that C is equal to 1. Namely, that's the case where primes split completely. But the famous theorem of uh, Lagarius and Odlisko is slightly modified by Sayre. Tells us that if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, this thing has, uh, let's simulate the main term is the size, the fraction of the elements of G that are in C times the total number of primes at the, the ground field plus error. And I'm just going to write now the, the error terms. So the error here in their estimate is um, the size of C times x to the half, the degree of the, let me call n sub k is the degree of the ground field, n sub k times uh, log mx. This same m that I, I didn't define for you before. It's, an, it's sort of like the radical of the discriminant. Okay, now uh, if you assume, as Ram and I did, Ram, myself, and Sarada did, uh, we showed that if you assume GRH, but also Artin's conjecture, that is Artin's polymorphic conjecture, <laughs> not the primitive root conjecture, maybe it's right, but Artin's polymorphic conjecture, then the error is O of now here. You see, you're not going to save on the x to the half. The zeros are on the line. They're going to give you the x to the half. What you save on is the field constants, and that's totally crucial. So here we get a c to the half, and we still get n sub k log mx. And if you assume the pair correlation hypothesis in addition, then what you get is So 
I'm assuming what Riemann hypothesis, the Artin conjecture, and pair correlation. Then you get that the error is bounded by uh, c to the half x to the half log x to the three halves the um, degree of the field to the half the ground field and then you get this this term the number of conjugacy classes divided by the order of the group to the quarter log m now we can if you change the hypothesis a little bit you can get you can do better on the exponent here but but let's have a look at this you see compared to what we have there uh, we've saved a little bit on the degree of the ground field and we've got this extra term now in the case that my extension f over k is abelian saving is quite mild so if f over k is abelian, this is um, c to the half, well, c is now 1, so x to the half log x to the 3 halves, the degree of the ground field to the half times log m. So I save all, I mean, to tell you that this is a spurious factor, and if we did this more carefully, it wouldn't be there, but basically the nk has been replaced with nk to the half. But the real power of this is when we're looking at non-abelian extensions. So for, for an extension for our L sub k or L sub q over q, the Kummer extension, and with c equals 1, that is splitting completely, what k is q, what do you get? You get x to the half. Now you get this factor makes a, makes a big difference. See, the number of conjugacy classes, the degree of the, of the extension, the order of the group is roughly like q squared, q phi of q. But the number of conjugacy classes is of the order q. So you actually get here a 1 over q to the fourth times log um, q over x. Yeah. So this does exactly what I was bemoaning earlier that the error term doesn't go to zero as I go to higher and higher Q's. So the result of that is now, if you put it back into the, I'm at way over time now. Notice I'm not stopping, I'm just observing that I'm over time. <laughs> so if you put this now back into, uh, now insert this, into the sieve n sub a x is mu a times pi x l sub mu k, yeah, thank you, mu k l sub k, then of course you have the main term which is mu k over uh, n of k times pi of x, but now for the error term, um, you still need even, so what does this do? Suppose if I just took error terms here, let's say let's say I'm able to truncate. Well, okay, what, plus what? Let's say I was able to truncate this at some y instead of going all the way up to x. Suppose I was able to truncate this at some y. Then what I'm getting here is x to the half one over um, one over k to the quarter. Is that right? Yeah, one over k to the quarter times, uh, let's ignore the log term for a moment, okay? So this is going to give me an x to the half uh, y to the 3 quarters. So if I want to make this exponent, let's say y, let's say I'm going to choose my y to be some power of x. Then to make this smaller, this exponent smaller than 1, I need 1 half plus 3 fourths alpha to be less than 1. So alpha, 3 fourths alpha, alpha should be less than 4 thirds of a half which is two-thirds. As long as I choose an alpha less than two-thirds, this first part, I can just use Chebotaro. Okay, but clearly if I go past that, this is going to, I'm going to be in the same problem as before. So then I revert back to the elementary method, the idea, namely change it. So for, for when k is large, 
or really I just need to worry about when Q is large, we need, we need to estimate Q uh, between Y and X, uh, this pi X L Q. Because if I get a bound for this, which is smaller than an x to some power less than one, this is an O term, it just goes into the other. Okay, so the idea that Hooley had was that, look, this is saying in, what is this counting? This is counting primes P, which split completely in LQ. In other words, uh, A to the P minus, uh, firstly P is one mod Q, and A to the P minus one over Q is one mod P. But now p minus one over q is less than x over y, because q is bigger than y and p is less than x. So this condition means that p divides a to the k, a to the r minus one for some r less than x over y. Now a number has roughly, a number n roughly has, we go of log n prime divisors, so that's a crude bound. So if I want to count the total number of primes that are appearing here, it's the sum of r less than x over y, r log a. And let's ignore the, the a for a moment. So this is going to be o of x squared over y squared. Right? So I want this to be now smaller than uh, an exponent. So this is x to the 2 minus 2 alpha. If I choose my y as x to the alpha. And so therefore, to make this exponent smaller than one, I just need alpha to be bigger than a half. Okay, so that's a lots of room here then, between alpha is half and two thirds. So what should I do? Well, let's optimize the, um, the uh, two error terms. So here I have half plus three fourths alpha, and here I have two minus two alpha. So what does that give us? That gives us three halves, um, eight, 11 over four alpha. So alpha is um, 12 over 22. So that means that uh, my exponent should be 1 half plus 3 fourths um, 12 over 22. So that's 1 half plus uh, 9 over 22. This will be 11, so this is 20 over 22, which is 10 over 11. So the error term then that you get from this is that if you assume Riemann hypothesis, Artin's conjecture, which by the way, in the Kummer case, you don't need to assume because you know, and the pair correlation hypothesis, uh, Riemann hypothesis, the pair correlation hypothesis tells us that n sub a of x is uh, the sum, the Artin constant, phi of x plus O of x to the 10 over 11 log n dx. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Kumar. Do we have questions for Mike? Yeah. So if we try to prove a logarithmic version of R to the vector, logarithmic weights on the, on the primes. Well, I remember that vector theorem is quicker to prove than the prime number theorem. So maybe I'm, I'm just wondering whether we need milder conjectures to ah, that. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I don't know that. So logarithmic weight where? In, in counting whether something is yeah, a... So when you count the primes, uh, yeah, let's take the yeah. sum of p over, uh, sorry, of 1 over p or log p over yeah, p. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. That's good. So, so then that will help you to detect, uh, it'll give you the asymptotic, but it'll tell you um, primes exist, which is a primitive root, but it'll come with a weight, right? So you don't get the number. I, I mean, I don't yeah. care about the number. I, mean, yeah. I, I just care about, um, about first the descriptions and secondly, yeah. Yeah. on its own, it's impressive to have the logarithmic uh, average. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I'm just wondering where, whether we need to let them run a hypothesis to do something like that. Um, as far as I know, no, but, but it's, uh, maybe others know better. Yeah. I have a historical question yeah. uh, because this is wrong. Uh, I 
No, it's it's good good point, but it's a repeat worth repeating that how the sieve and the elementary methods sneak past where a point where the Riemann hypothesis can't can't get through. So, yeah. so you must have tried to apply the first correlation hypothesis that could be the Langstroth conjecture for a hundred points. Yep. Many of all the these problems, all of them get improved, and in fact, uh, it's a good segue. What you say, the Lang Trotter problem, is is actually very closely related philosophically to the art and primitive root conjecture because what again it is about figuring out uh, prime splitting in infinite extensions. That's what this is. It's about prime splitting in infinite extensions, and um, the for the Lang Trotter thing, what we speculate. Is, so here we have L functions to help us. In the Lang Trotter case, you have a tower. It's a, it's a tower of uh, an elliptic tower, and you go through that. But we speculate that there is some L function at the top. It's a new kind of L function, and um, it this this L function is built up out of limits or averages of logarithmic derivatives of R and L functions. And in the limit, it loses the pole at s equals one. And actually, is analytic into the critical strip, but it acquires a pole at a half. And it's that pole that gives rise to the Lang Trotter conjecture. The root x over log x that they're conjecturing, uh, we say, occurs, we think occurs from a pole of a yet to be determined L function at the, at the top of this tower at x equals a half. Okay. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Ah, uh, it's a good question. I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know if there's a, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, now, yeah, we, we certainly something we're thinking about, but I don't have an answer. We have more questions. Okay, so let's thank uh, the